Good morning. Uh, merci beaucoup to Philippe and all those who organized the conference and made it possible. It's an honor to participate. Uh, this talk will be in English. I have a lot of slides for, with a lot of uh, English text if following the, the oral is uh, difficult. So I begin with uh, an overview. The proposed concept here is uh, neo-music as a shorthand term. Oh, not too dark. Okay. Uh, Neo-music is a shorthand term for self-administered affect management via user interface digital streaming, which I theorize here as symptomatic of musical listening and post fortis to neoliberal conditions in mature, overdeveloped uh, economies. My talk is a report on American culture, and uh, it would perhaps be related to, to places like France. The broader context is the, the histories of affect management, which I'll explain. And I want to look to continuities and differences from older music as externally managed affect management based on a one-size-fits-all forest regime of workplace background music, that is to say where the manager contracts with music providers. Um, and then to look to the rise of mood music LPs in the 1950s as a residential self-administered uh, leisure application of mood management. The more specific context is the recent sale of Muzak, literally the company Muzak to Mood Media in 2011. And that allows a window into the broader business of mood and the monetization of affect management. Some theoretical touchstones are uh, critical theory, uh, phenomenology, and mood theory. Um, the apocalyptic frisson comes from Adorno, um, but you could probably take that part off and just uh, still survive. Uh, my talk is just um, 11 pages, so hopefully I can get through the whole thing. Branded in 1934, Muzak later became an all-purpose epithet for hauntingly generic elevator music. Its critics heard it not as elevating, but irritating and vaguely totalitarian in its project of massified mood control. In 1987, Muzak merged with its smaller rival Yesco Audio Environments and, and switched from providing vocal free background music to a product line of 100 channels of audio architecture, often barely distinguishable from existing FM radio stations. The latter approach had defined Yesco's alternative approach of curated foreground music. In 2011, a young Ontario based corporation bought Muzak Holdings and the largest music library on planet Earth, so they claimed, for $345 million. The Mood, Me Mood Media Corporation's slogan, Mood by Design, crystallizes how today's Muzak, literally Muzak, functions within a multi-sensory ensemble of mood products. Amid intense sales competition from online-only merchants, multi-sensory marketing specialists like Mood Media promise special enhancements for terrestrial stores through the careful integration of sights, sounds, smells, textures, and carefully curated music. In the online world, many user interface music streaming services explicitly advertise themselves as new tools for user-guided mood elevation and enhancement. Spotify offers playlists for every mood alongside its on-demand tool where users, its traditional on-demand tool, where users choose to listen only to specific albums or artists. Mood Agent, now integrated into Spotify's product offerings, built playlists based on users' manipulation of five interactive uh, sliders for sensuality, tenderness, joy, aggression, and tempo. More simply, stereo mood lures users to turn your mood into music with a free playlist for every mood in your life. Songza's homepage links to expertly curated streaming playlists for 30-some moods from aggressive to warm. Music Covery's fun user interface mood pad similarly introduces the user instructs the user to roll a computer mouse around and play your mood. I didn't want to make it live because the computer might crash, but you roll around in there and, and play with your moods. 
After a preferred mood is indicated on the mood pad, music begins streaming to match and reinforce the named mood. The seemingly diffuse and mysterious world of mood experience, together with the recorded works of content providers, those we used to call musicians, is being repackaged and streamed online in terms of mood music genres. Along with sometimes mirroring whatever particular mood the listener is already in, a mood-tagged playlist, whether curated by staff experts or algorithmically generated, operates, operates like a generic sitcom's mechanized or canned laughter. Canned laughter is dialed up when a gale of collective laughter is expected by a sitcom's bid at humor, but there is no live audience to deliver the targeted response. Like an ancient Greek chorus, emoting in response to the dramatic events on stage, the laugh track laughs on our behalf. Muzak and related modes of so-called canned music have long carried the similarly vicarious workload of an invisibly singing ancient Greek chorus. In the realm of music, this practice of virtual vicarity or vicariousness, the partial exteriorization and mechanization of emotional activity, operates as what this essay calls the Muzak effect. Over the past decade in the US, Pandora Media Incorporated had by far the most listened to music streaming service at work and home. The Pandora algorithm emerged as the Music Genome Project, MGP, a vast and growing database of over one million song analyses in more than 500 genres and subgenres. The MGP has reportedly been hand built by staff music analysts. Both artisans and technicians, these analysts examine individual tracks in terms of hundreds of metaphoric musical genes in order to feed each playlist's sequence of recommendations. Panda, Pandora's new approach to preference prediction and music discovery aspired to know and stream what a listener will like before the listener can articulate what she might like to hear. While maintaining its original focus on individualized music discovery through the MGP's algorithmic operation, Pandora now also provides explicit genre stations and activity-based stations. Um, I, last time I checked, there were 13, um, oh, it's hard to keep track, 13 workout stations and 23 party stations. So they're really m perfectly mood-tagged parties following the model of newer mood genre and activity-oriented online music services like Songza and iHeartRadio. Like the smaller mood media corporation and major streaming rivals like Spotify, based in Stockholm, Pandora seems to be barely profitable. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to the, the man from Pandora. Though highly valued, Pandora is publicly traded, whereas Spotify is not. Nevertheless, Pandora listenership, market saturation, product placement, and ad revenues grew phenomenally in the past decade in the US, New Zealand, and Australia. That said, the era of peak Pandora may be behind us. Due to a very competitive market with very high fixed costs, royalties to those content providers, you remember the musicians, and some extremely rich competitors, including Google and Apple. Since only a small percentage of Pandora and Spotify subscribers actually pay for the enhanced premium option, which like Muzak and Satellite Radio has the value added feature of no ads. The businesses earn revenue by selling banner and between song ads narrowly targeted at individual listeners. The form and content of these ads are themselves indicative of another sea change as advertising shifts toward a privatized experiential marketing paradigm based on the one broadcast, one listener, narrow casting model rather than the older broadcasting model, one broadcast, many listeners. Stare into the mood spiral until it becomes an abyss and then wait for the abyss to stare back at you. Welcome to the age of Neo Muzak. Whether at work, home, the mall, the gym, or the bus, or in the car, web-connected subjects live and weave among an array of streaming platforms for algorithmic or curated musical moodscapes and affective atmospheres. 
The immense popularity of user interface music streaming sheds light on the historically specific tonal and affective worlds within which web-dependent cognitive laborers and others presently live. The shifting forms and functions of music delivery and ubiquitous listening adapt and revise literal music's classic function as an affective stimulant for the tailorized and externally administered industrial workplace. The new user interface online services are tools for building permeable microclimates of mood within which individual users attempt to manage their diverse portfolios of psychological capital. Mood management is the quintessence of affective labor in the ever-expanding service economy. Older delivery systems like Muzak, literal Muzak, continue to impart ambience through large-scale sonic air conditioning. Like a luxury store's distinctive scent, a carefully selected musico-affective uh, atmosphere is dispersed across workplaces large and small, brick and mortar stores and malls, and perhaps even the rare elevator. Large-scale sonic air conditioning has hardly disappeared, but it has also been digitally reformatted for ever smaller microclimates of work and leisure. The scale reduction in the rise of user interface streaming music is akin to the difference between a set of speakers nestled in a store's ceiling panel alongside the air conditioning vents and a desk laborer's pair of earbuds or headphones delivering the neo music tracks of a narrow cast streaming playlist. Alongside the tiny waves of sound streaming into individualized microspheres are signals of affect management's broader history. Mood theorists approach mood or moods as unmotivated and ambiguous because they are typically not set in motion by fast-moving autonomic affective responses or specific objects or intentional thoughts. The prototypical mood, after all, isn't directed at anything in particular. To be in a mood is to think and feel through that mood about everything. Mood arousal and coloration, whether in pursuit of the boldest reds or the deepest blues, has long been pursued through deliberate atmospheric manipulation and chemical intervention, such that they can be effectively measured, classified, and aroused. Moods are also objects of manufacture. They are pressed into genre logics and delivered to the targeted audiences of cultural forms, whether as tools of advertising, multi-sensory marketing, or playlists marking time with musical content between the ads that make the business a business. Music rather plainly primes emotional states directed toward very distinct objects, sometimes, whether feeling full lullabies whispered into a baby's ear or loud anthems de declaring ideas of and feelings of love of God and country, as well as more diffuse psychic states with no particular objects in mind ambiguous and objectless moods. Sustained listening reveries can drift with various degrees of attentiveness from an ambiguous and objectless mood state to the nostalgic unlocking of nests of private memories and associations and then whip back again. The mood music track hints at how all music is engineered to create a colored and textured audio environment. A kind of music-induced trance undergirds the automatism of much cognitive labor labor, as well as those dull, those dull but otherwise energized hours on the treadmill. The ambiguous internal-external circulation of atmospheric management by musical means encapsulates how feelings slip in and out of subjective boundaries. Moods sometimes involve emotions searching for appropriate objects, the philosopher Annette Beyer once observed. By contrast, mood music circulates emotional content searching for appropriate subjects or listeners <coughs> who can be attuned to its generic mood effects, consciously or otherwise. The listening subject's psychic porosity, porousness, and vulnerability at the site of music underwrites this essay's approach to music streaming services as flexible and individualized technologies for content delivery to microspheres of mood at work, home, and beyond. The new model quietly builds upon residual industrial and retail models for marketing moods through music delivery. The business of affect management and mood enhancement through recorded music blossomed with the 1934 birth of the Muzak Corporation in 
thank you, in Cleveland, Ohio. Its earliest programming was mostly popular music re-recorded, indexed, ordered, and distributed by wireless radio. The brand name fused music with the portable camera sensation Kodak. The business model was to sell genre-based stations transmitted exclusively to residential subscribers. Subscription-based music was similar to freely available commercial radio stations, but with several value-added propositions. Fewer interruptions or announcements, no commercials, and expertly curated musical playlists hand-selected for background functions. Protests from free commercial radio stations led the Federal Communications Commission to restrict music to commercial applications at first hotels and restaurants. The speakers amplifying seamless music programming could be hidden amidst large potted plants for a nearly magical encounter with unseen, unobtrusive, and ever-present music. Massive expansion came with the services adoption in industrial settings in the 1940s. Subscribers grew as studies proliferated about the productivity boosting value of moderately stimulating background music. Employers were convinced and Muzak's franchise numbers expanded, reaching 50 million listeners by 1950 and nearly twice as many 30 years later. As a standardized homogenous form <coughs> distributed en masse from a central transmission point, several, not, several scholars later noted, Muzak was perhaps the epitome of Fordist modernism. If so, it also sounded the engendering of affective labor amidst the flickering Fordist promise of integration and security. Taming current hit songs of attention-grabbing vocals, hard edges, grating dissonance, and rhythm rhythmic shocks, Muzak's output of softer, rounder sounds seemed to domesticate workplaces with a feminine sonic atmosphere. As Ronald Rodano has suggested, quote, by transposing a sonic image of a familiar domestic world into the public space, Muzak helps to temper the modern condition of dislocation and dissonance at the same time it metaphorically expresses that condition, unquote. Neo Muzak, figurative Neo Muzak, gives many listeners of the mature overdeveloped economies the soundtrack of our lives a soundtrack bearing traces of the past, but nonetheless highly symptomatic of our present. Mood Media Corporation uh, bought Muzak in 2011 and claimed that its new acquisition was reaching 100 million listeners per day. Perhaps, but Muzak had also declared bankruptcy in 2009. The brand name had been famous for so long through different radio formats um, that wholly different radio formats were mistaken for it, such as easy listening or light adult contemporary. A proposed 1960s slogan suggested a more golden age of confidence and market dominance, and the slogan was, boring work is made less boring by boring music. <laughs> Later scholars would mark the introduction of the stimulus progression curve in the 1950s as the creative high point of Muzak's industrial history. The stimulus progression curve, SPC, Systematized the crafting of music playlists according to 15-minute circuits from relaxation to moderate stimulation, followed by an equal interval of silence. Muzak's in-house psychologist noted that a sequence of tracks programmed to move from higher to lower stimulation would only create effective inertia and a mood of boredom. Allowing a track sequence to reach above moderate stimulation, on the other hand, would effectively overstimulate in terms of heart acceleration, respiration, and so forth. And it could stimulate a, a mood of counterproductive anxiety and over-alertness in the workplace. Through the SPC, entire workdays could be mapped according to finely tuned circuits of escalating stimulation and alertness and intermittent de-escalation. Different SPC sequences started from and reached different levels of affective stimulation and mood enhancement. A day set of programs could follow a plan for phases of higher stimulation and alertness. Thank you. Um, early morning and afternoon, and lesser alertness, such as the lunch break. <coughs> I'm going to skip uh, through a little bit because I don't want to go over too long. Muzak, music is art, Muzak is science, crowed an advertising slogan. The science followed the feeling theory associated with William James. 
where an automatic physiological responses to external stimuli precede and produce the subjective and conscious experience of basic emotions. Recorded musical stimuli were stabilized, measures, measured, broken down, and reordered according to typical physiological and affective response curves. The psychology of music undergirded the business of mood. And I will uh, just go through a little bit more of the history. Uh, mood music was rebranded for the LP in the 1950s, which allowed people to do um, at-home uh, mood manipulation, which is crucial. And then it m went into the world of mood radio in the 1960s and, and um, later. These and other terrestrial and satellite radio programming precedents for today's user interface and playlist content um, internet streaming services are rarely noted in journalistic accounts that tend to brim with, with market boosterism and techno-utopianism about new disruptions. Current discussions incorrectly depict digital culture in the new media landscape as utterly new worlds of big data algorithms, intelligence gathering, narrow cast stations, and individually targeted ad placement. I don't think I need to say too much about the importance of, of uh, the MP3 revolution, Napster, and piracy, which then created an explosion of free music, and which then led to the demand or seeming market need for Pandora. For listeners to be confronted by such an expansion of individualized, downloadable, free or low-cost music was often bewildering. This anxiety-laden laden paradox of choice haunts consumer activities from music streaming to online dating. Why not instead let a genius algorithm or playlist curator narrow down what to play and whom to date? Unlike the navigational morass of pirate downloading sites, only friendly and legal mysteries would float out of the magical Pandora box. The brand name connoted a black box of friendly mysteries and reminded users that the value-added factor of discovery was too often missing when playing tracks from a personal music library, however shuffled, or downloading preferred music from the web. And I'm skipping ahead to another example. Pandora and other free music streaming services feature be uh, banner ads. There's a banner ad over on the right. It's a drug ad. It's targeted to me, I suppose. It's for depression, anxiety, and other mood disorders. And I needed to show that along with some of the, the mood playlists. So genius targeting. Um, Pandora and other free musical service sites feature banner ads and audio ads between songs targeted to individual users by means of algorithmic measurements of the user's psychographic profile. Through psychographic services, web-based businesses analyze user data and measure demographic, mood, and preference profiles. As the digital culture saying goes, if you are not the paying customer on a for-profit internet site, then you are the product being sold to someone else. Pandora and related streaming services track, quantify, and bundle all their users' self-descriptions, clicks, preferences, purchases, and judgments of thumbs up and thumbs down. The vaunted autonomy and individualization of user interface music streaming services moves hand in glove with new forms of monetization through big data intelligence gathering, statistical generalization, and narrow cast ad targeting. Media theorist John Cheney Lippold has dissected the predicament in terms of the soft biopower of new identity codes created amidst the long chains of an internet user's web history of links and clicks and those of one's online friends and followers. Put otherwise, the listener is not simply the stable product being sold to advertisers and other purchasers of psychographic data. The listener is both the product being sold and the new consumer being created, the new algorithmic subject. Click patterns are collected, analyzed, and sold forward as psychological portraits of our digital lives as algorithmic subjects and advertising targets. The resulting patterns help shape our self-understanding amidst affect and mood management prostheses like Neo Muzak, Fitbit and wrist monitors, smartwatches, and health-oriented wearables geared to the emerging quantified self. And there's something on workplace antinomy. And then 
Uh, part of the context in the U.S. Mm -hmm. is the, uh, the psychiatric context. Upwards of 50 million Americans carry prescriptions for sleep aids. Um, and there's a lot more to say about that, but I, I don't want to be the person who goes too far over. I don't know if you can read that map very well. But um, as of 2010, a full one-fifth of Americans were being treated with Prozac and other mood elevators, uh, women being nearly twice as likely to take such medications. And so there is a very great uh, market demand for um, relief from depression and anxiety and, of course, lots of very expensive drugs made available. And Neo Muzak is part of the ensemble of mood elevators made available to us. If you're interested in what drugs people take in different regions of the U.S., this map may be <laughs> of, of assistance. And I'll finish by talking about the importance of nostalgia, which is something I, I write about uh, most of the time when I write about actual music rather than the uh, music delivery systems. One lay technique for responding to the twin demands of increased stimulation for work and decreased stimulation for non-work time is to increase positive emotional and cognitive involvement through familiar music. Such music is likely to temporarily induce pleasant psycho psychic involution through nostalgia and thus reduce negative forms of anxiety-inducing stimulation keyed to the present or risk assessment about the future. On-demand services like Spotify invite listeners to choose preferred music already ripe with personally significant emotional and cognitive associations, while Pandora's classic mode focused on half-surprising listeners with music similar to already preferred music. In a form of self-managed exposure therapy, novel stimuli are accepted or rejected by Pandora listeners at an easily controllable rate, one song at a time. As a team of business school psychologists, this is the last page, uh, concluded in a recent experimental study, quote, consumers underestimate the power of their familiarity with a song on choice, a finding that correlates with the findings that consumers overestimate their desire for variety, unquote. Consumers often proclaim their openness to new sensations and opportunities, but the reward patterns of pre-existing neural pathways ripe with long-term potentiation may be stronger. Marketers make Marketers mine such pre-existing patterns to redirect a pathway's endpoint toward particular products that you should now buy. If, as marketing research contends, consumers are more likely to choose familiar songs in the course of self-selected music, we must consider nostalgic mo moodscapes as crucial to neo-music. Music can function as a mood elevator or self-soothing self tool via the non-subjective Muzak effect, even by priming nostalgic retrospection. Soundscapes keyed to these memories bear unusually heavy affective and cognitive loads. For many adults, deliberate musical listening is mostly nostalgic listening. Classic radio, classic rock, classic pop, classic hip-hop stations. My car radio is full of that. Such nostalgia has a specific con conceptual and emotional content that, and can be distinguished from the more generic and non-individualized content of archetypal mood music, the old mood music. That said, one can also be nostalgic for past feelings of nostalgia or other specific mood experiences. We might propose a speculative extension to the empirical findings. Holding on to long-term mood music preferences may be a kind of conservative ballast against both ambient anxiety and the strong market and social pressures for software and hardware upgrades in self-fashioning. The new iPhone. The new app. Deliberately wallowing amidst the various light and dark shades of nostalgia through the generalized tools of tempo and key is a manipulable variable for priming the pump of consumer desires. New research and old advertising alike show how nostalgia and slow minor key music can create an, emotion, an emotional itch that only the pleasure of impulse shopping can effectively scratch. Energies unconsciously directed at an idealized but absent object from the past can be transferred over to the shiny and good enough commodity of the moment. Audio architects and multi-sensory marketers are banking on it. The study of slow tempo and minor key background music for in-store terrestrial shopping takes us full circle from the history of mood music's industrial application to the present situation of industrial psychologists working with multi-sensory marketing and audio architects. And here are two uh, pills available on cam in my campus um, at the store ne across from my office. Neo Chill and Neo Energy.
And you already have Neo Muzak on your phone. Thanks very much.